This tape is a continuation of the previous message. Praise is not a new message, it's an old message. It goes back to the beginning. It should spring from our understanding of the very nature of God. And what's that? That he's worthy of all worship and honor and power and glory and thanksgiving and adoration. He's worthy of all these things. In Luke chapter 24, last chapter, last verse, 53. Well, 52 and 53. This is after the ascension. This is before Pentecost, so that's in that little interim. They worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. In the temple praising God. They did it in public with other people around. This is in the interim between ascension and the day of Pentecost. They worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising or praising and blessing God. And then over in Acts chapter 2, they didn't stop once they got the baptism. <laughs> they just carried it on further. Acts 2, 46 to 47. I'm not including all the passages we could look at in the Bible on praise um, in case the Lord may have some other messages that will use some of them. If he doesn't, then you'll just have to think of them yourself. Acts chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. They, the early church, post-Pentecost church, they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house and eat their meat with gladness. It's always that theme. I don't know about sad Christians. I haven't ever met one of those. I always find in my Bible that God's people are happy, they've got joy, and they're glad, and they're Amen. praising God. Praise Say, well, I'm an exception. Well... I wouldn't be claiming it if you thought that you were. Praising God. What were they doing? He gives us a list of things they were doing. They were with one accord in the temple. They broke bread. They ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They, verse 47, were praising God. I don't think they were just saying let's praise God, but let's do it. Let's praise God. They were praising God. Praise is a verb. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. What do you think that was like? But they must have been somehow praising God so that people could know that they were praising God. Right. And they may have used the words, praise God. <laughs> they were praising God, though, and the people knew it. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. How do you like that? That's like the testimony I just gave you from my own life. People didn't despise them. Sometimes they will, but they didn't hear. Some people will, but not all people. Sometimes it will, but not on all occasions. They were praising God, and they had favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church those that were being saved. Over in Acts chapter 16, <clears throat> we know that the early church and its early leaders, Paul and his minister friend, Silas, were singing the praises and the victory during the middle of the night. After a beating and in jail, Paul and Silas were singing the praises of the Lord and rejoicing in the victory. I truly think, friends, that some people, we know this is true of the denominational church mind, but there are some people, maybe even outside of that, who have in their mind a false conception of who Jesus or who God really is. They picture God or they picture Jesus, you know, Solemn, serious, long face. I want to give you some teaching in this area before we're through this morning. It really blesses me what I'm going to share with you now. God, he's the great God. You read the Old Testament, you read statements, and that would lead you, if you didn't know other statements, to think that, yes, the great I am, the great abstract one, that he's just God, the distant unmoved, unmovable, abstract spirit up there. And if what I've been saying to you thus far this morning is true about us, what characterizes us characterizes God. What he requires of us is part of himself. You know, he said love, God is love. Live the light, don't hide your light. Well, God is light. He never hides his light. Rejoice, be filled with joy, gladness, shout the victory. Well, that must mean those things characterize God as well. Hallelujah. 
Let me give you something. We're going to get into the New Testament and look at specific verses, but in the Old Testament, I won't try to give any verses. I'll just kind of sum this up. In the Old Testament, in many of the <clears throat> Old Testament victory passages that speak of God that he's spoken of as a mighty warrior as a triumphant one I'm thinking right now I guess among other passages of Exodus 15 the Lord is a man of war he's seen as it were riding on a horse stretching out his arm wetting the sword bending the bow and getting the victory and through it all, shouting with the voice of triumph as a mighty man who wakes from slumber or from sleep. Now those are metaphors. God's not a man, but they're expressing something that is the reality in God. That God rejoices in getting the victory. God rejoices in getting the victory. I don't know what this is going to do to your theology, but I'm going to say it anyway. It makes him joyful and happy to get the victory. I'll tell you something else that makes him happy. Whenever the wicked, through their own devices, stumble and fall. Oh, he that sits in the heavens shall laugh. Psalm 2, we're told. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. He shall have them in derision. God laughing? He does. Happy over someone's fall? Well, that's not what makes him happy. He's rejoicing in that he and his standard are upright and true. Those who don't measure up to that fall. Even the, even the wrath of the wicked, we're told, will work to God's praise because they show him and his standards to be just and right and true. Well, I think there's even a verse over in Proverbs. I can think of another one in Psalms. I have to look them up. I won't probably take all the time. Let me find the one in Proverbs that will agree with Psalm 2. Well, it's in chapter 1 of the book of Proverbs. There's another Psalm that says the same thing. I could find it for you, but I'll give you the one in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 and verse 4. Well, there, you've got a cross-reference. I thought it was in 37. It's in Psalm 37, verse 13. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. I just quoted that to you, Psalm 2. Now, Proverbs 1, verse 24. Because I have called, and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye said at naught all my counsel, and would none of my reproofs. Not God's fault. He's tried to win the people, gain the people. And they spat at him. And God said, all right, this is called holy laughter. This is divine retribution. This is as you sow, you will receive and reap. It's not God. He didn't curse anybody. They cursed themselves. He stretched forth his hand and they said, no, we don't want you, God. All right, God said, verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity and I will mock when your fear cometh. So God in the Old Testament, like a man of war, riding a victory horse, laughs through the victory, rejoices in his triumph. Do you not think that God rejoiced in his triumph over old wicked Pharaoh? Do you think God rejoiced? Surely God rejoiced over that wicked man who had oppressed his people for so many years. And with all his worldly, shrewd, ungodly, foolish counsel and wisdom, thought that he knew best and better and God sent in his prophet Moses and his prophet Aaron and his prophetess Miriam. He sent them into that land and delivered his people and threw all of Pharaoh's mighty men and their horses into the sea. You don't think God was rejoicing that he got the victory over one of the workers of the devil? Pharaoh just worked under Satan. He was a worker of the enemy. God rejoiced over that. Let's come over to the New Testament. Maybe show you not such a, that's kind of a vengeful side of the joy and laughter. We'll show you maybe a, well, I can't even say what I was going to say. Show you a sweeter side because it kind of starts off the same way. In Luke 10 and verse 21. Well, let me read Luke 10, 17 and following. Then we'll get down to 21. Luke 10, 17. We'll start with this because that's part of the context here. What is your picture of God? What is your picture of Jesus? Some 
apathetic stoic up there like the denominationals think or some charismatics or you know what friends we just never have thought if we haven't thought this deeply I don't mean to detract from all of the eternal listen to me splendor and majesty of Jesus Christ I don't mean to humanize him but having said that I say the rest of what the Bible says that he laughs, he smiles, he's happy. When his kingdom is promoted and advanced, which means when we're happy and advanced, when we get the victory, that makes him happy and joyful. That makes him rejoice. Amen. I'm going to give you some scriptures for that. Let's start with Luke 10, 17. The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He's rejoicing over that. The disciples are rejoicing. He's rejoicing. Got the devil on the run now. I've got a force in the earth, the apostles, the beginning of the church. Israel, they forsook all this, and they're worshiping the devil, called the doctrine of the scribes and Pharisees. Now I've got... Some people in the earth who are going to use my name and believe me and exercise faith. And the devil is on the run. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice. Notice all the joy and rejoicing terms because your names are written in heaven. And in that hour, Jesus, let me give you what the Greek says, rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Not in spirit small. The Greek says in the Holy Spirit. Now, if all you had was spirit, you wouldn't know if it's in his spirit or in the Holy Spirit. The Greek says that he, in that hour, rejoiced in the Holy Ghost. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. He rejoiced. Now, rejoice doesn't mean, oh, I rejoice. <laughs> what does it mean whenever you rejoice in it? He said, oh, praise God. Well, I thank the old father. What's that? But oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Mm, he said, but well, it's in the Bible. I'm not making anything up. He rejoiced in the Holy Spirit. Doesn't the apostle Paul tell us in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God's not in, in meat nor drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, praise God. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God that you hid these things from the big heads. She <laughs> revealed them to the babes, the simple. Praise God. That's what he said. That's why we can rejoice. People don't understand sometimes what makes us happy. What makes us happy isn't maybe what makes them happy, but it makes us happy. That God reveals it unto the babes and not to the wise and prudent. Big terms that just mean the big heads, the know-it-alls, the worldly wise. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father, for so... It seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. That's election there. Only those to whom the Son gives the revelation will ever hope to have it. But Jesus said, I thank you, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you can use those words, or he used other words, or the Bible used other words on other occasions, or you could say, praise God, hallelujah, for the victory. Praise God that God is a God of truth, and his ways are going to be made known, and they're going to be worked out in the earth. And here's one of his ways, and he doesn't give it to the political heads and the religious big shots. He gives it to the simple, to the babes, not to the wise and prudent. And Jesus thought that was something to say praise God about. In Hebrews 12 and verse 2, he had the cross before him, but there was also some joy set before him. Amen. Now, whatever joy means for you, it means for him. The Greek doesn't change. Who for the joy that was set before him Hallelujah. endured the cross, disregarded the shame, and is set down on the right hand of God. Who for the joy that was set before him. 
Joy of what? Well, the joy of Luke 10, 20, that a whole lot of names are written in heaven. The joy of some of those sheep coming in. A joy, who for the joy set before him. He didn't go to the cross for himself. He went to the cross for us. So what makes him happy? But us. What makes us happy? Our victory. He already has the victory. He's the God of victory. His joy is our joy. Whenever we're filled with joy, whenever we get the victory, turn over to Luke chapter 15. I didn't mean to send all of you run into Hebrews 12. I just was going to tell you about Hebrews 12. But over to Luke chapter 15. Now, this is what will really bless you. <laughs> See, I've already been really blessed, all right? This will really, really bless you then. Amen. <clears throat> Luke 15, 1 through 10. Kind of reads like Luke 10, that whole context there, especially verse 21. I'm saying that Jesus wills our good. He wants you to be blessed. He wants you to be holy and healthy and happy, and he's happy when you're happy. And he's smiling whenever you're smiling. And I'm not trying to humanize him or deep God him, make him less than he is, but he is God, and if you have some other conception of God, then it's not a biblical conception. That's a carryover again from denominationalism. Amen. When you think that he doesn't smile and rejoice and maybe jump and dance. I couldn't picture God. Well, we do it and the angels do it. And everybody else who's holy and healthy and happy does it. Anyone who's right before God does it. Maybe God does it then. Who are you to say that he doesn't? Unless you've got scripture that says that he doesn't. Maybe when something happens that's positive and good in your life, when you get the victory, maybe Jesus gets up and jumps and dances and rejoices. Hallelujah. The burden of proof would be on you to prove that he doesn't do that. Amen. And I don't know of any verses that would say that he would, and I find some here in Luke 15 that would indicate that he would. Amen. Hallelujah. That ought to just bless you so much that he's happy when you're happy, so you're going to be happy so he can be happy Amen. when you're happy. I mean, if you really love someone, your wife, your child, you, you love it the most, you almost could say you love them the most whenever they're happy. You're your most happy when they're the most happy. Amen. When things are just going so well for them, you just are so happy. You're just so thankful that things are going well for them. And things aren't going well for them, things aren't going well for you. God's closer to us than a spouse, than a parent. He's our God. He's our creator. He's the one who loves us eternally with an unconditioned love that has no faults in it like our love has selfish motives on occasions. He loves us with a perfect love. What makes us happy makes him happy. You see what I'm saying? That means when we come into his presence or when we're out in the world and we're not at church, we should be happy rejoicing in him. If we understand his nature and his character. We know that he rejoices. You know, before reading this, turn over to uh, <laughs> Hebrews. Oh, Hebrews 2. I'll say it again. I don't mean to detract from his majesty or to humanize him, but this is not what we're doing. You're just yeah. describing him in his state of being fully God, fully man. You're describing him as he really is. In a sense, now I know that there are ways in which charismatics will take these things and they end up with some old, let's sing the blues, country, and western, he's my best friend type approach to God. <laughs> and Jesus ain't a friend, he's the God Almighty. Amen. He's the eternal God. But once we do away with that uh, approach to friend and brother, he is our brother. Amen. The Bible says that he is in Hebrews 2. I don't mean that in that old country and western way that a lot of charismatics are, even non-charismatics talking about, you know, hey, God is for real, man. He's my friend, my pal, my buddy. <laughs> you have to wonder what subculture those people are from <laughs> who talk like that. But if we can keep his majesty intact, that he's not a man, he's God from eternity, then we can realize, but he humbled himself Philippians 2, and became a man, and in doing that, he became our brother, according to the flesh. He became our brother to identify with us in all of our weaknesses and in all of our trials and temptations. He was made just like us. 
Well, Hebrews 2, 16. Verily, he took not on him the nature of angels. Well, they're spirit. That's a different thing than God and than man. Well, God is spirit, but angels are created spirit. Verily, he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. And Paul in Philippians 2 just praises the humility of the whole business of the incarnation. That it was a tremendous, unimaginable step of humility for Jesus Christ, who was God from eternity. He wasn't some babe born in Bethlehem. He's the almighty God, the Prince of Peace, wonderful counselor, the father of eternity, who became the babe born in Bethlehem. What a humbling step. He took on him the seed of Abraham. Look at verse 17. Now look at it. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. God's brothers? God? Well, you could hardly say that of God the Father, but you could say that of God the Son, Jesus Christ. It behooved him to be made like his brethren. Now, he teaches us, by the way, listen to me, I'm trying to make a point of, of clarification and distinction here. He teaches us to approach him as Lord and Savior and Master. We don't pray to him as brother. But he's trying to show us through using a term like that that he can sympathize with us, that he has emotions, he has feelings. Whenever we're happy, he's happy. Whenever Thomas saw him in his resurrected state after his doubting period and Jesus said oh Thomas reach forth reach forth your fingers and put them into the nail prints in my hands and reach forth your hand and thrust it into the spear in the spear hole in my side and be not faithless but believing did Thomas have to do any of those things no 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 he said that he would have to but once he saw him you see once you meet him you don't have to have proof of it once he saw him, what did he say? My Lord and my God. Now that was a man who had died the death of any common criminal. And how did he describe him? But with the utmost terms, not of respect, but of deity. Oh, my Lord and my God. That's in the end of John 20, if you're wondering where that is. You can read it for yourself. Thomas, I'm trying to show you, even through the crucifixion, here's a man. You know, you can't kill God. God, as God, is pure spirit. You can't kill God. They killed Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. When Thomas saw him after that doubting episode in his life, and Jesus revealed himself to him for who he was, Thomas had a new conception. This isn't kind of God, kind of man, kind of man, God, kind of mostly man. Oh, my Lord and my God. Is how he addressed him. He didn't say, oh, praise God, big brother, you're back. I never find in the Gospels, or I never find what we're instructed to, or I never find in Acts or the Epistles where we have an example of someone saying, brother Jesus. Now, they say brother one another. I never say, I never hear them addressing Jesus as brother when they pray to him. They say he's Lord and God, King, Savior, Master from eternity. You see the distinction that we're making. Charismatic, some of them, even denominational people. I think I might have told you back in biblical literature that the heretic, J.B. Phillips, had a lot of bad things to say, but he had one good thing to say. He wrote a book entitled, Your God is Too Small. And he was coming against, this has been years ago, he was coming against that, well, it came out of a hippie culture of, hey, man, friend, brother, pal, soul brother type thing that, they begin to, and we, we address some of the translations. You know, treat me cool, Lord. God is for real, man. You remember those biblical translations? <laughs> if you can call them translations of the Bible, treat me cool, Lord. That's a paraphrase of one of the scripture texts. God is for real, man. Um, he was coming against what was coming out of that subculture and environment where we were humanizing Jesus and making him, well, put your hand in the hand of the man. You remember that song? Put your hand in the hand of the man. <laughs> No Christian should be singing some honky-tonk song like that. That, out, that. that record played round and around in our home. We thought, hey, man, we're kind of religious and kind of pop and kind of western and kind of voodoo and a little bit of everything mixed together. Put your hand in the hand of the man from Galilee. Well, you see, that's, you're really 
you're only emphasizing one aspect and, and you're emphasizing such a way you're robbing him of what's doing him. He's not the man from Galilee. He's not a man. He's God. Old Doubting Thomas didn't say, oh, man from Galilee, I'm happy to see you again. He said, my Lord and my God. He didn't call him man or brother or friend or pal or buddy. He called him Lord and God. And so J.B. Phillips has some good things to say addressing, I don't know if when that song came out versus when he wrote the book, but he was addressing things like that. Your God is too small. When you start calling Jesus my big brother, see that never has gone over very well with me. It doesn't now. I don't call him my big brother, but at the same time I can think Hebrews 2, 16 and 17 thoughts so, of without having to call him big brother. Big brother. That's a, really a thing you wouldn't want to call him. You know where we get that terminology from. But my big brother, my elder brother. But if you'll turn back now to Luke chapter 15, we'll get into this. We don't mean to detract from his majesty, but we are like a brother of his. And true brothers rejoice over one another's victories. You know, this is in the context, I won't read the first couple of verses, we only have really two there, but it's in the context of the religious leader saying, oh, Jesus, you're fellowshipping with the wrong people, the babes, the simple, the ignorant, the foolish, instead of those wise and prudent. That's just like Luke 10, 21, because that's the very people he chooses to fellowship with. And so he gives them a couple of, well, really three parables, the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. I'm just going to read the first two parables. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Now, all of the imagery here doesn't necessarily match all of the imagery used elsewhere. I mean, evidently what he's talking about here, a hundred sheep, and then you've got a lost one, well... How could, the lost, how could you call a lost person one of his sheep? That's a goat. But he simply means a hundred human beings here. And you've got 99 of them that are righteous, that serve God, that are sheep. And you've got one that's straight. In a technical theological sense, he's not a sheep. He's a goat. But Jesus calls him a sheep to show them his concern and sympathy for that one that he has chosen and elected. Even before he's called, before he hears of his election yet, God still calls him a sheep. And he said that he would leave the 90 and 9 out there in the wilderness and go after one. We wouldn't do that. We'd say a sheep wants to get lost. That's his own problem. I'm not going to go looking for one and forfeit the life of 99. And you don't get into it, well, is that what Jesus is doing? What you get into is a point that he's trying to make that he's concerned individually with every one of us. He's not forsaking the 99, but the 99 passed out of the picture in the imagery of the parable here to show that he's concerned individually about every single one of us. There's one that's lost. And because he's so concerned about that one, it's as though the 99 can be left where they are. They don't need help anyway. They're already righteous. They're already found. They're sheep. And he goes to find it. Verse 5, and when he had found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. Who is the one who goes and looks for the sheep but Jesus? Who is the shepherd, John 10, but Jesus? When he finds that one, what does he do? He rejoices. Now, if words mean words and the scripture is the scripture, then we know what he's doing in heaven. Whenever he finds one of his sheep, he rejoices. Whenever he gets a lost one and he wins them into his fall, he rejoices. Whenever a Christian has strayed and they come back to the truth, he's rejoicing. Whenever they get victory in their life, he's happy, he's smiling, he's rejoicing. When he cometh home, he calls together his friends and neighbors. Now that would equal all the angels in heaven then, right? He's in heaven now. His friends and neighbors saying unto them, rejoice with me. Praise God, for I found my sheep which was lost. Now he's going to apply the parable. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven to let you know it's not just on earth 
when he was a man on the earth is in heaven. That likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. More than over 99 just persons which need no repentance. Well, those are the Pharisees and the scribes. And then you've got a woman who's lost a coin of several that her husband had entrusted to her care and she finds it and she calls her friends and neighbors together saying rejoice with me verse 10 likewise now this is a little bit different than what he says in verse 7 he adds to the teaching likewise I say unto you there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth but you see who is the shepherd in scripture but Jesus who is the one rejoicing but Jesus. To make it more minute, whenever you get some physical healing, some financial blessing, he's rejoicing with you. We need to hear words and teaching like this to encourage our little much afraid, fragile hearts. We're told that if you don't do this, God's going to do that to you. He just wants you to serve him in joy so that he can be filled with joy. When you get a victory in your life, then you can just picture him. He's smiling. He's rejoicing. He's happy. He wills our good, our blessing. What a mystery to us, friends. How humbling of him. How uplifting to us. He came down so he could lift us higher. That should bless your spirit and your heart when you think, wow. I never have pictured him just smiling and maybe even getting up from the throne and rejoicing and leaping. The angels do it throughout all eternity. We're going to do it throughout all eternity. I believe that he does it as well. He's rejoicing. I'll give you another interesting thing. We're often told in scripture that through the process of well, it's sometimes called in theology the session of Christ, but I would give you one aspect of the session, which is the ascension, but he is seated at the right hand of God in heaven, right? That he is seated. Whenever Stephen gave that wonderful defense of the truth against those blasphemers of God and the disobedient Jews and the Sanhedrin of his day, whenever he gave that wonderful defense and he didn't hide any lights of his he said you rebels you stiff necked you uncircumcised in ears and heart you resist the Holy Ghost like your fathers did and they stomped up their ears they threw dust in the air they ground their teeth together in anger and rushed on him with one accord and took him out of the city and stoned him before they did he said I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing by the right hand of God. Did you hear the position? Standing, not seated. Now he's seated everywhere else. He's standing. Why? He's there standing to receive this faithful martyr. Stephen's rejoicing. Jesus is rejoicing. Nobody's crying. Death for a martyr is a happy time. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116. Blessed are they from henceforth who die in the Lord. Revelation 14. He stood to receive him. Well, if you're standing and you're rejoicing because of your victory, although you might not be going to him right now, he's probably standing and rejoicing with you. Now, don't get your mind into it. Well, that's going to have him like a jack-in-the-box up and down over every victory somebody had. You don't get your mind into all that. Just know that he's rejoicing. Whether he's standing or whatever he's doing, he's happy. He's smiling. I'll tell you something else about him. Hallelujah. Same book here, Luke chapter 12. Verse 4. These should be precious words that are dear to your heart. I say unto you, my friends, Wow. See, passages like this won't influence you. People out there in the subculture, counterculture movement who want to talk about friend and big brother and pal, and, and they're using what they think are some biblical concepts, you know, Jesus is our friend, what a friend we have in Jesus. And really, they don't even know what they're talking about because until you have him, first of all, in all of his majesty and splendor, 
then to have him call you his friend doesn't mean anything to you. It's just, yeah, he's my buddy. But whenever you see who he is, that he's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, that he's the eternal God, the Father of eternity. And then, once you have all of that, you see, my friend doesn't help until you have all of it. You've got to get things in biblical order. Once you have that, you know who he is. And when he said, I say unto you, my friends, this is God who said, my friend. Three times in Scripture, that's no surprise. We've got other support for that. Three times in Scripture, God calls Abraham my friend. Abraham, wouldn't you like to be called God's friend? Well, you just were. In Luke 12 and verse 4. Let me give you those passages. We'll look them up here real quickly. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20. There's one in 2 Chronicles 20, Isaiah 41, and James 2. I got them memorized. You don't have to, but they're pretty easy. But it's a real blessing just to, well, take the New Testament one if you don't remember the Old Testament one and meditate on what you have here. 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verse 7. Art not thou our God who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel? God in driving out, that's the book of Joshua and Judges, all of his might and power, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend. He's the one man, the only man in scripture has this special distinction of being called by name God's friend. Abraham, God's friend. Then if you turn over to Isaiah chapter 41, God has friends. Isaiah 41 and verse 8 but thou Israel now God is speaking art my servant Jacob whom I have chosen the seed of Abraham now it's not thy friend someone talking about it this is God's own word the seed of Abraham my friend and then in James 2 if you don't remember those you can just remember James 2 the works and faith passage James chapter 2 and verse 23. This is really even the better known one anyway, but it's based on the Old Testament passages. The scripture was fulfilled which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, that's Genesis 15, 6, and he was called the friend of God. I don't know why they capitalized it like he's, like that's his name, friend of God. This, this is friend of God. I'd like you to meet friend of God. Friend, first name of, middle God, last. Friend of God. But it's all right if you want to capitalize it. He was called the friend of God. Well, where was he called that? Second Chronicles 20 and Isaiah 41. He was called the friend of God. And then to give you another passage, though, that applies to you, that's just to show you that God has friends that he calls friends by name Abraham. Why couldn't he call John Smith or Mary Doe or Cheno Ross? He's my friend. We are his friend. You are. We are. All of us are. We're friends of God. Jesus is our friend. See, if he left us with that, oh, all the abstractions of transcendence, then we would kind of be a little bit timid about him and maybe he's not concerned or it's too small of an issue or... You know, he's God after all, and I don't want to bother him. But, you know, a friend, you know, what's a friend for? A friend is to go and talk to him. You need a friend, then you need to borrow something, or you need some help. Who do you ask? You ask a friend. You don't ask a stranger. God's not to be a stranger to us. He's our friend. He has to ensure the fact that we realize that he's close to us. He's far, because he's the God whom the heaven of heavens can contain, but he's also closer than our breath. He's our friend. John 15, 15. Henceforth, you know what henceforth means from here on out. Henceforth, I call you not slaves. For the slave knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. John 15, 15. From here on out, I don't call you slaves. Why? Because the slave is ignorant. He just does whatever the master says and doesn't think and doesn't have any option and doesn't have any inheritance. He's just a piece of property. I don't call you slaves. I call you friends. The, the slave doesn't know what his Lord does, right? Verse 15. 
Here's the contrast. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. I've kept nothing back from you. A slave, he doesn't know. He just has to obey. The master says, do it, and he does it. He doesn't ask questions, and he doesn't know why he's doing it. Jesus said, that's not like you. I brought you into my very counsel. I've given you the very counsel of the Godhead because he was the fullness of the Godhead in bodily expression. And all things that I know is God, all things that I've heard of my Father, I've revealed them to you, I've told them to you, I've given them to you, I told them to you. Therefore, he said, on that basis, I can call you my friends. Friends. Friends are happy when friends are blessed. Friends rejoice with friends. Amen. So praise God. Let's remember that he's our friend and that should cause great joy in our heart. Amen. He's forever our friend. You get in some difficulty, he's your friend. He's God. If he was only a friend and not God, then he couldn't help because I can't always help you even though I might be your friend. So we've got to have more than a friend. But he's God who is a friend. He's God who is a friend. I don't know about that old song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, because people don't really believe that, and it's, they sing it with unbelief, and it mistranslates the Bible in Isaiah 53, all of our griefs and sins to bear, and the Bible said all of our sicknesses and sins to bear. But at least the name of it is true. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Amen. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, and they surely do. Yeah. They forfeit a lot of peace because they neglect to carry everything to God in prayer. Yeah. They sing about it, but they never do it, though, do they? That's a problem with a lot of songs, a lot of worship services. They talk about it, and they don't do it. They talk about it, and they don't do it. We sing that all the time. What a friend we have in Jesus, and he wasn't our friend. We are, we are friends with the devil, friends with this world. All our griefs and sins to bear. And we never took any grease. We took it to the head shrinkers. <laughs> we never confessed sin, and, and that's a mistranslation of Isaiah 53 anyway. He didn't say anything about griefs and sorrows. And that's another point. You see, we always have him pictured, oh, Jesus, that man of sorrows. He's a man of, he's a man of war and victory. He's not sorry about anything. I realize that the crucifixion was a dark hour, but even in a dark hour, he said, Oh, Father, I'm going to do your will. Not my will be done, but thy will be done. And for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and is set down. For the joy set before him. I know that was a dark hour. But he's not a man of sorrows. All these paintings that you get out of in statues from the medieval ages of the man of sorrows and songs about the man of sorrows. They were, by the way, they got that out of uh, Isaiah 53, a man of sorrows there. He's a man of joy is what he is. Amen. He's not sorry about anything. He hasn't lost any victories. He's won every battle he's ever entered. That wouldn't make you sorry. That'd make you happy. Amen. He'd be better called the man of victory or the man of war or the man of joy Amen. than the man of sorrows. Oh, I know what they're probably meaning by that, but what they're probably meaning they take to probably mean some other things that are wrong. They have this whole picture of him basically weeping most of the time. You know, I find it is, they'll tell you where that verse is, the shortest one in the Bible. They know where that one was. Jesus wept. They don't know that one over there in Luke 10 where Jesus laughed. And you know he laughed at? That religious people are ignorant. He thought that was pretty funny, that God had revealed the truth to the simple. You see where I get my spirit and personality from? Same place you're supposed to get yours. From God, right out of the Word. I don't try to be offensive, but sometimes that's just you just have to start chopping the wood and let the chips fall where they may. What he got a kick out of, sorry about that word there, but was that God in all of his wisdom. I mean, this is really pretty funny. You. <laughs> you're pretty funny that God told you the truth. Who are you? 1 Corinthians 1. That is pretty funny, isn't it? <laughs> that was something worth laughing about and rejoicing over. That's pretty strange. That's odd. <laughs> That's what he was rejoicing in. Praise God. We can rejoice in that. Let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. That's the context of 1 Corinthians 1. It's a rejoicing passage. And Paul said he's not chosen the wise, the mighty, 
the prudent, the intellectual, but he's chosen the opposite, those with opposite characteristics who are, oh, kind of funny. <laughs> A little bit odd, a little bit strange, maybe a little bit weak in the head. So people say, well, the only reason you go to religion is you need a crutch. That's right, I'm in one. I need some help. And so do you. You're running for help everywhere that God says don't go to. That's right, I am weak. That's why I got some religion. Because I knew I couldn't do it on my own. People try to shame you out of your faith. Well, the only reason is because you were weak of heart. That's right. I was Amen. weak of heart. Amen. And I needed some help. And I was willing to confess it. And you're just too proud to confess it. You're weak too. Amen. We're all weak. We're all undone. Amen. You were just too proud to admit it. Yeah, we're a little bit odd. But, you know, there was a saying that went around here. I guess it's been a long time ago when uh, all these things were happening with the Jews. <laughs> I don't know who made up the little saying, but it was going around how odd of God to choose the Jews. Oh. <laughs> and you know how true that is? How, and he says that. That's in line with the Old Testament. He could have chose Egypt. Wow, what a nation he could have made out of them. Well, no, because they were already made themselves. Or Babylon. What a kingdom he could have had sitting on the throne of Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine Jesus sitting on the throne of Pharaoh or the Caesars or Nebuchadnezzar? He said, I'm going to sit on David's throne. A shepherd boy who played musical instruments out when he should have been washing the sheep. Oh, you see how God's wisdom is. Oh, just makes your heart rejoice. Skip a beat or add two in there. Enjoy over the victory that God has. He has counted us worthy and privileged us and condescended to our level to sit on the throne of a shepherd boy, not a great Pharaoh. They're still digging those guys up over there in Egypt. <laughs> They're still with us today. They're so mighty and powerful. They're still digging them up. David's bones have decayed. Some of the Jews might not think so, but they have though. They've decayed. Peter said that in Acts 2. They're gone. He saw corruption, but Jesus never saw corruption. But he sat on the throne of David, not some mighty person. God, in all of his wisdom, has come down to our level. That's what the mystery of the incarnation is all about. Great is the mystery of God, and his God was manifest in the flesh. Incarno, it's a Latin word that he robed himself with flesh. And when he did that, he called us his friends. Praise the Lord. Let's rejoice in the Lord this morning, then. Hallelujah. I'd like to give a little testimony this morning and then there's a song that would be easy to learn. It has to do with the doxology. A week ago Friday when I was working, those words are going through my mind and I was just meditating on the majesty of God and how true those words were. I said, Lord, all the, word, all the music that I've heard is always so dead and dry. And I began to sing that Praise to the King Who Reigns in Righteousness song and I had the new melody for the doxology. So I'd like to just share that with the body and it goes right into Praise to the King. <laughs>
Thank you. 